Holy Father, what Jonathan and Bobby Lynn just sang. Jesus said, if you want to pray, pray like this. And so as the sun nears the western horizon here on the west coast of this great nation, and as Friday slowly wanes into history and a brand new Sabbath dawns, dear God, please, if the testimony of Jesus is your gift to us, then we hear his testimony now. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. May Jesus be front and center these 24 hours, beginning right now. We pray in his name. Amen. This last summer, I received a letter from one of our young adults who had just graduated from Andrews University. Email. So let me read a line or two from the letter to you. Dear Pastor Dwight, yada, 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 the first paragraph. My other reason for writing, here we go. My other reason for writing, finally after all these months, is unfortunately about a burden I have been dealing with this last year. Someone close to me who left the Adventist church several years ago has become increasingly negative about Adventism. At first, it was a general anger and frustration over wrongs inflicted. I don't know what. I felt that patience and love and encouragement were the best response. However, in the last year, conversations regarding Seventh-day Adventists have become increasingly more bitter and hateful, especially involving Ellen White. My burden and heartache are not for the shaking of my own faith. My trust is in Jesus. But I'm so worried about this person's hate and their potential to discourage and hurt those around them, many who are close to me and young in the faith. I feel so drained and helpless after these conversations. Are there any books, any sermons that address these kinds of accusations? Should I spend my time seeking out explanations, or is that a waste of energy? Should I just let it go and trust that God will work out everything for good? Any thoughts you have would be greatly appreciated. I hope this email finds you and your family well. Thank you so much for your time. God bless. And the signature. Tonight we come to the gift part four. Those of you who are joining us for the, for the Sabbath, this is a, this is a little five-part miniseries. The gift part one. We went to the foot of the cross. We asked ourselves... At this place where the testimony of Jesus is loudest and clearest, what will we hear when Jesus speaks of himself? That code phrase, as you remember, tucked away six times in the apocalypse. The Greek construction makes it clear the testimony of Jesus is always his own testimony about himself. It's not my testimony about him. It's not your testimony about him. It's his own testimony about himself, Calvary. We spent the whole evening at the foot of the cross. Calvary is the pinnacle, the apex, the shining summation of the truth and the testimony of our Lord Jesus. But when we turn to the apocalypse and noted one of the instances where that code phrase, the testimony of Jesus, is used, this was just last evening, we noted that the Bible's last book identifies the testimony of Jesus as, Revelation 19.10, the spirit of prophecy. Or the presence of a prophet in the midst of the community of faith. So we spent a Wednesday evening asking this question, Ellen White, what was she really like? Last night, Ellen White, how... Does it really work tonight? But what about the critics? What do, you do with a, what do you do with a young adult who raises the questions in this email? How do you respond to the young of this generation? Many of whom, who even though they have grown up within the, within the bosom of our community of faith, have absolutely 
no working knowledge of this, this, this gift, the testimony of Jesus. It was Abraham Heschel, the great rabbi and scholar of the 20th century, who wrote these words, and I want to put them on the screen for you. Let's put them on the screen. You see it up there? Go to the next slide, please. Ah, I see what you were saying. You were saying that uh, even though it's here for me, it's not here for you. Okay. Well, we can take care of that in a hurry. I'm praying hard. <laughs> Don't put me back on the screen. <laughs> Whatever you do. That's not the answer to our prayers, trust me. All right, I'm going to do this. Okay. Now, how's the screen look? All right. One more. Now watch this. Abraham Heschel, the great, uh, the great rabbi, 20th century, brilliant scholar. His two-volume set of books, The Prophets. I have both books in my library. Let me just run a line or two from Heschel by you. He no longer lives, of course. Over the life of a prophet, words are invisibly inscribed. All flattery abandon ye who enter here. Do you know why he wrote that line? Because you would have to be a fool to want to be a prophet. That's why. I'll tell you what. You want to be a prophet? Be assured of this. They will ridicule you while you are alive, and they will excoriate you once you are dead. Nobody in his right mind ever hopes to be called to be a prophet of the Most High God. You'd be a fool. All flattery abandon ye who enter here. Now, Heschel goes on. To be a prophet is both a distinction and an affliction. The mission he performs is distasteful to him and repugnant to others. No reward is promised him, and no reward could temper its bitterness. The prophet bears scorn and reproach. He is stigmatized as a madman by his contemporaries and by some modern scholars as abnormal. So what's the surprise there? Ah, oh, there's just something wrong. Trust me. There was a little something wrong that explains the gift. Welcome to the world of Ellen White, who in 1883, in a letter to the editor Uriah Smith, with striking and vulnerable candor, let me, sh let me share a portion of that letter with you right here. Do you see this? She's writing to Uriah Smith. He was the editor of the, ad of the Review and Herald. Why do you remain as silent as the dead, Uriah? Why are you sitting on your hands? What has closed your lips? Can't you speak up? Haven't we known each other all our lives? Why do you remain as silent as the dead? Is this the way you defend the truth? Truth will triumph. I expect that the raid will be made against me till Christ comes. Every opposer to our faith makes Mrs. White his text. They begin to oppose the truth and then make a raid against me. Why, I ask, is all this zeal against me? I am watched. Every word I write is criticized. Every move I make is commented upon. I leave my work and its results until we gather about the great white throne. End quote. I'll let God be the judge. I'll let him have the last word. Welcome to the world of this little five-foot, two-inch woman named Ellen White, who at the age of 17, began a 70-year journey under the burden of that divine calling. All flattery. What did we just read here from Heschel? All flattery abandon ye who enter here. Does that mean that we ought not to question the writings of the prophet? Are you kidding? We ought to. Listen to this. She's writing here. Every charge should be carefully investigated. It should not be left... In any uncertain way, the people should not be left to think that it may be or it may not be. Don't just leave everything hanging in limbo. Plunge in and investigate. Examine the charges. 
The people must not be left to believe a lie. They must be undeceived. Welcome to tonight's teaching, the gift part four. But what about the critics? Open your Bible with me to a passage you have never read in all your life. Oh, you have read through it, but I predict you have not noted what you read in Ecclesiastes. Open your Bible to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. That would be the Old Testament if you're looking around. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm going to be tonight in the New King James Version. And that's all I'm going to say about this Bible. <laughs> well, since you brought it up, those of you who are here tonight for the first time, I wasn't going to bring this up, but they reminded me. Those of you who are here tonight for the first time, we're delighted to have you. And God will bless the Sabbath together. This happens to be the new Andrews Study Bible from Andrews University. And so that's why everybody's so excited that I have this Bible. <laughs> and tomorrow night, right after sundown, these Bibles go on sale at the ABC. And so <laughs> this is the New King James Version. All right, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let me get this on the screen. Those of you that didn't bring a Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9. And moreover... Because the preacher was wise, capital P, preacher, Solomon referring to himself, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many Proverbs. Solomon's describing the writing of the book of Proverbs. All right, let's go to verse 10. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. Those of you that have the New International Version, he sought to find just the right words. And what was written was written, and what was written, rather, was upright words of truth. Unbeknown to the reader, Solomon has just described how he wrote the book of Proverbs through the, under the guidance of divine inspiration. We need to jot the steps down because, as it turns out, the most common charge of the critics against Ellen White has everything to do with inspiration. How does God inspire a prophet? So I want to jot it down real quick while it's fresh in our minds. Grab your study guide. You already have your study guide? Grab your study guide. Now listen, they came and told me, Dwight, we're all out of study guides. We had 2,500 of them. We can't figure out what's happened to all of them. We don't have time to, to run off anymore. And so here's what I'm going to do, because this is probably the next to the most important study guide of this entire mini-series. Tomorrow night's Taste them again for the first time, the most important. You want tomorrow night's study guide, but here's the deal. How many here, let's just find out, how many here do not have tonight's teaching, tonight's study guide? Hold up your hand. All right, so you see those hands, particularly around the periphery. Now, here's, here's the other deal. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. We, we don't have extras, but there may be a few extras. If you are a husband and wife, keep your hands up. Those of you that put your hands up, if you are a husband and wife sitting near one of those uplifted hands and you each, each of you has a study guide, would you please be willing to, to uh, I have two study guides and you have none, and just hand <laughs> that study guide to your neighbor who's holding his or her hand up. They're all the way out there into the back. And so this is a study guide that you want to have. You must have this study guide. Now, listen, you're saying, Dwight, I'm really not into this, but I'm kind of curious. I'm not going to raise my hand because it'll look like I'm interested, but could I see these when nobody's knowing that I'm seeing them? Yes, you may. Let me, uh, let me, let me put our website. If, guys, if you could put this on the screen, please. Bless you, uh, technicians. This is the gift part four in this little mini-series. If you go to our website, pmchurch.tv, www.pmchurch.tv, the gift is actually an 11-part series. Took a whole semester last fall to teach at Andrews University. You go to that uh, website, you'll find all the study guides, all the podcasts, all the video casts, no charge to you. You may, you may review them at your leisure. I am praying that as you ponder and brood over this teaching, that it will become clear to you. Tonight's is critical, and tomorrow night's is even more critical. You see, the president, I saw uh, Pastor Al walking around out here helping with the study guides. The president wrote me back in, uh, in the fall after we had agreed on this date. He wrote and he said, hey, Dwight, you know what, you know what we need? 
We need, we need something to empower and ignite our witness. It's just a, across the land, our witness has become so tepid and so lethargic. Could you do something that would help us focus on that witness? Well, the thought occurs to me that if we want a testimony that radiates with the Lord Jesus Christ, the secret is the gift of the testimony of Jesus. It's his own testimony about himself. There is no gift wrapped up in Jesus that will be more electric to your own spiritual journey and resplendent to your own personal witness than that gift, the gift. Jesus is the gift. The testimony of Jesus is all about our Savior. So I have absolutely no qualms recommending this teaching series to you. Go to the website, www.pmchurch.tv. You didn't get a study guide tonight? There'll be one waiting for you there. All right. We, got, we, we need to keep moving here. So let's, let's, read, let's read one more time Ecclesiastes 12, verses 9 and 10. And then I want to jot down the process Solomon has just outlined for us. And moreover, Solomon writes, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, the NIV, just the right words. And what was written was upright words of truth. The process ends in words of divine truth. All right? So let's jot it down. What have we just seen? Get your pen ready to go. Number one, this is one long sentence, but I've divided the sentence into four parts. Part one of the sentence, in an effort to teach the people. This is divine instruction. That's what Solomon is, is describing here. In an effort to teach the people, right in the word teach. Number one, in an effort to teach the people. Number two, the inspired one, that would be the author, the prophet, the inspired one gathers together his sources. Key word. He gathers together his sources. Human research and reading are now taking place. He wants to teach. He gathers together his sources. That's number two. So that number three, he now is able to grapple. He grapples to find acceptable words. Notice Solomon says, I had to find just the right word. The human writer is looking for the right words, number three, so that, number four, he might be able to communicate what will turn out to be, this is what's so amazing, what will turn out to be words of truth. That's authoritative, divine revelation. See, we just read right through that because we're so excited to get to the end of Ecclesiastes at last. But in verses 9 and 10, Solomon has, has in, 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 in a subtle way, told us how he put together the book of Proverbs. Because as it turns out, now this is, what, this is what will catch us by surprise. As it turns out, Solomon isn't the only one whose words are in the book of Proverbs. Oh, it's true. He's considered the author of the book, but hold on. He did exactly what he describes here. He gathered material from multiple sources. Now, let me run this, run these, uh, a little division of the book of Proverbs. The words of Solomon are from chapters 1 through 22, and then chapter 25 through 29. Then comes, now isn't this amazing, then, and you'll have to fill this in. Then comes the words of the wise. Scholars have examined those words and have discovered striking parallels with the Egyptian. Now, that's a key word. Please write it in. They've, dis they've studied uh, Proverbs 22 through 24 and have discovered a striking parallel with the Egyptian work, the, the Egyptian book, we would call it today, the wisdom of Amenemeh Mope. It's an Egyptian source. It is a pagan source. Key point. Solomon goes to a pagan source to find material for his inspired book. Key point. All right? Then we also have the words of an un uh, unnamed wise man. That's 24 parts of 24. Then we have the words of Agur in chapter 30. We have no idea who this is. And we have the words of King Lemuel in chapter 31. Is it a code name for Solomon? We have no idea. But isn't that amazing, ladies and gentlemen? God uses a pagan source for material in Solomon's inspired book of the Bible, the Proverbs. Now, would you fill this in, please? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Read it out loud with me. All Scripture is inspired by God. God breathed all Scripture. Would that include, by the way, the book of Proverbs? Oh, yes, it does. 
And does the book of Proverbs include an Egyptian source, a pagan source for some of its Proverbs? Oh, yes, it does. All Scripture. All Scripture. And by the way, when Paul wrote those words, the only Scripture around at the time, except for the growing New Testament, was the Old Testament, was it not? All Scripture. is God breathed. Apparently, would you jot this down, please? Apparently, divine inspiration allows for the inspired writer or prophet to consult and quote non inspired sources for his divine revelation without giving credit to those sources. Amazing. Not only does he quote pagans, he doesn't even give credit to the pagan source he quotes. Wow. What's going on here? What's going on here is divine inspiration. That's what. Isn't that something? Because I'll tell you what. That is precisely the most repeated charge the critics have leveled against Ellen White, charging her with blatant plagiarism and the use of other sources with the intent to deceive her readers by not giving credit to those sources, just like Solomon didn't, just like John the Revelator didn't give credit to his uninspired sources. Do you realize that? That the book of Revelation is laced with an uninspired source? Did you know that? It's called the book of First Enoch. It's part of what's called the pseudopigrapha, the false writings. Straight out of the false writings, John quotes, and by the way, hold on, he even quotes the, the uninspired source to describe his I saw visions, an uninspired source to describe his inspired visions, and he borrows it all. Watch this. Here's some examples. Put it on the screen for you, please. Well, no, we, yeah, we need to do this one please, first. Did you know that John the Revelator actually borrowed multiple lines from a non-inspired source and quoted them? Would you just quickly jot in that word, quoted, and quoted them as if they were his own words? Now, let me give you some examples. Oh, what is more, let's, let's, let's get this going here. What is more, he borrowed the non-inspired author's words for some of his I saw decorations. Now, that's a very important point because that charge is made and reiterated today. I want you to see that the precedent is the great and inspired prophet John. All right? All right, so let's take a look at First, uh, first Enoch. Here's First Enoch chapter 40, verse 1. After that I saw, okay, that's Enoch writing. After that I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the Lord of the spirits. John comes along in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number standing before the throne. Looks awfully familiar to me, doesn't it? Let me share another one with you. First Enoch chapter 86, verse 1, and I saw, and behold, a star fell from heaven. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, and I saw a star fallen from heaven. What's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? Amazing. In fact, one list, would you jot this down? One list shows 22 lines from the book of Enoch that John borrows in order to write the book of Revelation, all of it, by the way, without giving any credit at all. Shall we call John the apostle? Shall we call John the revelator a plagiarist? Nobody breathes that thought. And yet when Ellen White is, here's the anachronism, when Ellen White does the very same thing and borrows from non-inspired literary sources like Solomon and sometimes uses their words to describe her, I saw visions like John... The critics yell, foul time out time. You can't do that. Must be a bad tree with bad fruit. Must be a false prophet. Are you serious? The problem with the critics, and I want to say this as, as graciously as I intend to say it. <laughs> the problem with the critics, and I went to one of their websites, by the way, and with what righteous indignation and fervor he went after Alan White for doing precisely what Solomon did and what John did in their books. The problem with the critics is that they have an uninformed and unbiblical concept of divine inspiration. That's the problem. They're using a caricature. 
They're not using the divine model, a caricature they've created to judge the writings of this little five-foot, two-inch woman. What's the biblical concept of inspiration look like? I like the way my friend Judd Lake, I like the way my friend Judd Lake, a professor in the School of Religion at Southern Adventist University, describes the Bible model of inspiration. Let me put this on the screen for you because you're going to have to fill it in. He calls this method, he calls this model, the whole person inspiration model. Can I put it on the screen? There it is. The whole person. Would you jot that in, please? The whole person model of inspiration recognizes numerous modes through which the Spirit of God worked with human beings to produce Scripture. Judd Lake writing, one of these modes relevant to the issue of literary borrowing is that of historical research. In this mode, the biblical author produced inspired writings independent of dreams and visions. He received information through research, reading, studying, compiling, and editing material from various documents, literary borrowing, generated by both inspired and uninspired authors. Keep reading. Nevertheless... God was providentially present, and he, God, was supervising the entire process, end quote. The whole person model of inspiration. One of the gospel writers used that rather dramatically. Can you remember the gospel writer that did, that did the research first and then said, now I'm writing the gospel? What was that gospel writer's name? He was a physician. What's his name? Luke. Luke. Luke says, I did the research. I checked all the sources out. I've compiled it. Here it is. We consider Luke inspired, do we not? Matthew and Luke, by the way, both borrow from Mark without ever giving credit to Mark. Mark's the first gospel that comes along. Solomon, Paul, and John, all quoted from non-inspired literary sources. That's how this whole person model of inspiration works with Bible writers. And I believe we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that is precisely how it also worked with the spiritual gift of Prophecy ministry of Ellen White. It worked the same way. We believe she experienced divine inspiration in the same manner and to the same degree as the biblical writers did. Does that then grant her the same, same authority as the Bible? No, it does not. And I'll get to that in just a moment. So how do the critics respond? It's rather fascinating. Here's how they respond. While they might grudgingly accept the obvious fact that Bible writers, Bible prophets utilized extra-biblical, non-inspired literary sources for some of their writings, the critics are quick to assert, whoa, 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 time out, time out. Ellen White used way more literary borrowing than the Bible writers did, so she is a plagiarist. Think about the logic of that for a moment. In fact, Tim Poirier worked through the logic and he works it through for us. I'll put his words on the screen. The rebuttal from Ellen White's opponents to this comparison is that the quantity of copying is higher in her writings than among the Bible writers. But the amount of borrowing is irrelevant to the question of whether inspired writers may legitimately use the language of other authors, including extra-biblical sources. Once it is recognized that inspiration is not negated by the use of pre-existing human sources... Are you following this? Once we agree, yep, Solomon did it, John did it, Luke did it, they did it. Once it is recognized that inspiration is not negated by the use of pre-existing human sources, who is to say what percentage of an inspired messenger's language must be free from such dependency? Did you follow that line? If it's, if it's, if 10% is okay, then who's to say 12% isn't? Who's to say 30% isn't? What if it all were? Once the biblical model is identified, how can we attach percentages to it? So here's the question. How much of Ellen White's writings, how much of those writings were dependent upon other literary sources? Let me, let me flip. This is fascinating. This is from Fred Veltman, who spent eight years trying to ascertain the level of literary borrowing and wrote the following in his conclusions. You can get all this online. If you have the the study guide, there's your online reference, okay? 
A fair assessment of the evidence should not deny or underplay the degree of her, Ellen White's, dependence, but neither should it overlook or depreciate her independence. The, and I, li I love this line right here. The sources were her slaves, never her master. Do you get the point he's making? She decides. They don't decide for her. She decides. Or, or more accurately, the one who is inspiring her makes the decision. Leave that alone. Take this. How else did John know what in, in the book First Enoch to take and not to include? How else did he know? He knew because somebody was inspiring him. All Scripture is God-breathed. Somebody is inspiring him, saying, you can take that light, leave that one, don't touch that, take that. No, 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 skip all of that. It, went, it worked that way for Solomon. It worked that way for John, Paul, Luke. But you read the critics. And you'll hear that 90 to, 80 to 90% of Ellen White's material was borrowed. But I'm going to run some numbers by you if you want to jot these down. Tim Poirier found these numbers grossly inflated. Great controversy. Okay, the, the, the apocalyptic classic. Uh, I'm going to bring that book into the pulpit uh, tomorrow night in our, in our finale. Great controversy contains 15.1% source-indicated quotations and another 5.1% of uncredited quotations, total 20.5%. Great controversy. Sketches from the Life of Paul, her book, 12.23% borrowed material. Steps to Christ, total 6.2%. All of the books, excluding Desire of Ages, were 3% or less of borrowed material. In fact, did you know this? In the introduction to that apocalyptic classic, Great Controversy, Ellen White tells the reader, you are about to see I am borrowing material. Watch this. These are her words. You haven't been in the study guide. The great, this is the introduction. The great events which have marked the progress of reform in past ages are matters of history well known and universally acknowledged by the Protestant world. They are facts which none can gainsay. In some cases, now listen, in some cases where a historian has so grouped together events as to afford in brief a comprehensive view of the subject or has summarized details in a convenient manner, his words have been quoted and in some instances no specific credit has been given. Keep reading. Since the quotations are not given for the purpose of citing that, uh, that writer as an authority, but because his statement affords a ready and forcible presentation of the subject. One more line. In narrating the experience and views of those carrying forward the work of reform in our own time, similar use has been made of their published works. End quote. Now let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen. Right here. For us today, all right, for us today, 2011, and we're enrolled in a university. That's where I live, on a university campus. Any university in the land, any community college in the land. For us today, using the material of an author without crediting the source or without the utilization of quotation marks will get you thrown out of any university campus in this nation. True or false? Of course it's true. It's called plagiarism. By the way, because of the internet, students have become very creative. <laughs> they can surf the web and can find, they can do research in just 30 minutes and a whole term paper comes together. How do you do that? I don't know. But they surf the web. I happen to teach at this theological seminary. I teach a class a year. And I learned from my colleagues. You know, professors may be slow, but they are not dumb. <laughs> and the professors of the United States have, united, have banded together. And they have created an electronic computer program through which you will pass the student's paper. And that program will spot every place in cyberspace where that student has borrowed material. You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> you thought you had it all figured out. So, look at, look at, ladies and gentlemen, we all understand this. You can't do that today. That's cheating. You can't take somebody's material and just not put the quotation marks around it. But the 19th century is not today. And I'm going to show you. This, this will just blow you out of the water. It did me. 
And by the way, Mark Twain, you remember Mark Twain, the American humorist and writer? Mark Twain wondered out loud if there was, quote, anything in any human utterance, oral or written, except plagiarism. <laughs> it's all plagiarized, Twain said. Let's be honest. Denny Fortin, dean of the Theological Seminary at Andrews University, and Jerry Moon, professor of church history, also in the Theological Seminary, they've written a piece on plagiarism to appear in the forthcoming Ellen G. White Encyclopedia. I'm going to put Fortin and Moon on the screen. Fascinating. Watch this. The practice of borrowing from other authors without giving explicit or detailed credit was widespread among writers of the 18th, 1700s, and 19th, 1800s centuries. Although by today's literary standards, this practice is unacceptable, it forms the historical context of Ellen White's own practice. Such a practice was followed, for example, by her hero. She's Methodist. You knew that, didn't you? She's Methodist. She grew up a child of the Methodist church. John Wesley was one of her heroes, spiritual heroes. One of my heroes, I must admit. Such a practice was followed, for example, by John Wesley in writing his book, Explanatory Notes Upon the New Testament. Now, they're quoting Wesley now. This is Wesley, not Jerry Moon and Moon, not Fortin Moon. Here's Wesley writing. It was a doubt with me for some time, he wrote in the preface, whether I should not subjoin to every note I received from them the name of the author from whom it was taken. I really debated whether to give credit for all the quotations I had. But, now re read, upon further consideration, I resolved to name none. I'm not going to give one of my sources. I resolved to name none that nothing might divert the mind of the reader from keeping close to the point of view and receiving what was spoken only for its own intrinsic value. End quote. Wesley's words ended. Isn't that amazing? Wesley says, hey, I finally decided, I'm not giving any footnotes. I'm not giving any credit to anybody because I don't, don't want people to be distracted by my sources. I want them to see the point that's being made without worrying about where the material came from. Amazing. Now, as Denny and Jerry further write, and I'll put uh, their words on the screen here, the real issue, however, is not whether she, Ellen White, borrowed without giving proper credit Here's a real issue. But whether she borrowed in such a way as to deceive the reader. She's been accused of being a thief, a liar, and an exploiter of church members who constituted a captive market for her books. End quote. That's the critics, their charges. So then we need to ask this question. Did she set out to deceive her readers? In The Great Controversy, for example... Ellen White borrowed extensively from Daubigny's History of the Reformation, Wiley's History of the Walden Seas, J. N. Andrews' History of the Sabbath, Uriah Smith's The Sanctuary and Its Cleansing, and her own husband James White's book, The Life of William Miller. Now, these books were all well known to her Adventist readers. In fact, get this, in the Christmas season of 1882, she wrote a piece for the church journal, The Review and Herald, and she, she made this invitation she urged her readers to purchase Daubigny's History of the Reformation to, and I'm quoting her now, provide something to be read during those long winter evenings. And if you live in Michigan, you know what those long winter evenings are like. So she says, go out, please, for Christmas. Buy yourself Daubigny's History of the Reformation. Now look, if you are a plagiarist, the last book you want anybody ever to lay their eyes upon is the book you're plagiarizing. True or false? But of course. And then she says, please, this Christmas, do yourself a favor. Buy this wonderful set of history books, Daubigny's History of the Reformation. Six months. Here's another illustration. Six months after she comes out, after she comes out with her book, Sketches from the Life of Paul, 1883, an, a, an advertisement for Coney Bear and Housen's book, The Life of St. Paul, a book, by the way, Denny Fortin and Jerry Moon tell us significantly influenced her own, her own book, with 12% of her book estimated to be borrowed from Coney Bear and Housen. 
Six months before she comes out with her own book, an ad appears in Signs of the Times magazine, you've heard of that magazine, with her endorsement of their book. And these are her words. I regard this book as a book of great merit and one of rare usefulness to the earnest student of New Testament history, end quote. I repeat, ladies and gentlemen, if you are a plagiarist, the last book you want your readers to be reading is the one you're plagiarizing. She tells them, go get the book, read it for yourself. What's the point? They didn't consider it plagiarizing back then. That's the point. John Wesley didn't consider it plagiarizing. She didn't consider it plagiarizing. The publishers who knew didn't consider it plagiarizing. In 1981, the legal aspect of the charge that she plagiarized was examined by Roman Catholic attorney Vincent Ramik, a specialist in patent, trademark, and copyright law in the Washington, D.C. law firm Diller, Ramik, and White. He released his 27-page legal opinion in August after spending over 300 hours researching about 1,000 relevant cases in American legal history. His conclusion, I'll put it on the screen for you, Based upon our review of the facts and legal precedents, Ellen White was not a plagiarist and her works did not constitute copyright infringement or piracy. It is impossible, Ramik goes on, to imagine that the intention of Ellen G. White as reflected in her writings and the unquestionably prodigious effort involved therein was anything other than a sincerely motivated and unselfish effort to place the understanding of biblical truths in a coherent form for all to see and comprehend. Considering all factors, therefore, necessary in re reaching a just conclusion on this issue, it is submitted that the writings of Ellen G. White were conclusively unplagiaristic, end quote. All right? All right, all right, Dwight, come on. Okay, so she's not a plagiarist. But you know what the problem with you, Adventist, is? You consider her and authority equal to Holy Scripture. Says who? Says who? Not one person in the history of this church has ever so suggested. Simply not true. In fact, here's, here's, our, here's our fundamental belief 18. The Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. The Bible and the Bible alone is the standard. It is a concocted charge that has no basis in reality. Ellen White consistently reiterated the point. You'll need to fill this in in your study guide. He Christ, he Christ taught that the Word of God was to be understood by all. Jesus pointed to the Scriptures as of an unquestionable authority, and we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the Word of the infinite God, as the end, I'd call that the last word, as the end, fill that in, of all controversy, and the foundation, or the bottom line, of all faith. The Bible is to be presented as the end of all controversy, and the foundation of all faith. Isn't that amazing? Ah, uh -huh, then, Dwight, you know what you're saying, aren't you? You are saying that she has no authority in your church? Oh, my friend, she has plenty of authority in, in this community of faith to which I belong. We can illustrate it this way. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, you remember that story, don't you? When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, a prophet named Nathan, you remember the story? Nathan came walking in and pointed his bony prophetic finger into the face of David, and he says, you are the man. You remember that? Oh, yeah, we remember that story. Now, hit the pause button. For one split second, did David question the authority of Nathan? Hey, wait, 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 hey, Nate, 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 time out, my friend. I have the Bible, and the Bible in David's time would be just the Pentateuch, those five books. I have the Bible, Nathan. You haven't written a single book in the Bible, so you have zero, nada, no authority with me. Adios. Did David so respond? When that prophet pointed his finger into David's face, the 
the monarch collapsed in tears, did he not? I have sinned. Nathan, jot this down. Nathan was a non-canonical prophet. Not a single book in the Bible. Nathan was a non-canonical prophet, but he had plenty of spiritual authority. Just because you don't have a book in the Bible does not detract from your spiritual authority if it's the genuine gift of the Most High God. Now, let's say that archaeologists this Sunday dig up his book. You know that Nathan wrote a book? He really did. Was it, uh, is it, uh, yeah, 1 Chronicles 29, 29. Nathan actually wrote a book. It never ended up in the Bible. But let's say archaeologists on Sunday are digging somewhere in, in, uh, in uh, Israel and they unearth the long lost book of Nathan. Would the newly discovered book inspired, would it become a part of our Bible canon? Once they find it, do we, do we now have 67 books in the Bible? Yes or no? But of course not. Gerhard Fondo. His word, no, 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 no. It would remain an inspired book outside of the canon. And if a theological statement were found in the book, it would remain an inspired and authoritative statement outside the canon. So it is with the writings of Ellen White, ladies and gentlemen. Inspired like the ancient prophets, absolutely. Canonical like the ancient prophets, not at all. Authoritative like the ancient prophets, but of course... I like the way my friend Merlin Burt, director of the Center of, of Adventist Research at, at uh, Andrews University, Merlin Burt put it this way, the quality, would you jot this down please, the quality of inspiration in her, Ellen White's writings, is the same as that of the Bible prophets, but the purpose is different. Jot those two words down. The quality the same, but the purpose is different. She expressed that her messages were for the purpose of leading people to the Bible. I'm a little light pointing to the great light of Holy Scripture. To testify to the centrality. That was her ministry. To testify to the centrality and the primacy of the Bible. She wrote, now these are her words, I have a work of great responsibility to do to impart by pen and voice the instruction given me not alone to Seventh-day Adventists but to the world. I've published many books, large and small, and some of these have been translated into several languages. This is my work to open the Scripture to others as God has opened them to me, end quote. It is the critic's inability to differentiate between inspiration and authority that has caused their utter confusion. And those who have not examined the subject for themselves but have just voyaged for a while through cyberspace are drawn into the same vortex and same confusion. And their baseless charge that Seventh-day Adventists hold the writings of Ellen White is equal to the Holy Scripture is answered with the three words, we do not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the book right here. This is it. This is the book right here. This is the book of our authority. This is the last word and the bottom line of all truth right here. In fact, in 1982... In the document titled, The Seventh-day Adventist Church's Understanding of Ellen White's Authority, this document was published. Included in the document, fascinating, are ten affirmations and ten denials that enunciate the authority of Scripture and the place of Ellen White's prophetic ministry in our faith. I'd like to close today, and then I'm going to sh share with you a YouTube clip, all right? We're going to end with a YouTube clip, but before the clip, uh, you, it's on the, it's on the uh, back, or is it the third page of your study, guys? Is it the third page? Yeah. I want to go through those with you. Printed right there in your study guide. Here we go. Affirmations. Here come the ten affirmations. Put them on the screen as well. Number one, we believe that Scripture is the divinely revealed Word of God and is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Number two, we believe that the canon of Scripture is composed only of the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. Number three, we believe that Scripture is the foundation of faith and the final authority in all matters of doctrine and practice. Number four, we believe that Scripture is the Word of God in human language. Number five, we believe that Scripture teaches that the gift of prophecy will be manifest in the Christian church after New Testament times. Number six, we believe that the ministry and writings of Ellen White were a manifestation of the gift of prophecy. Number seven, 
7, we believe that Ellen White was inspired by the Holy Spirit and that her writings, the product of that inspiration, are applicable and authoritative, especially to Seventh-day Adventists. Number 8, we believe that the purposes of, of the Ellen White writings include guidance and understanding of the teaching of Scripture and application of those teachings with prophetic urgency to the spiritual and moral life. Number 9, we believe that the acceptance of the prophetic gift of Ellen White is important to the nurture and unity of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And finally, 10th affirmation, we believe that Ellen White's use of literary sources and assistance finds parallels in some of the writings of the Bible. 10 affirmations. Now, just as important, 10 denials. Here we go. Number one, we do not believe that the quality or degree of inspiration in the writings of Ellen White is different from that of Scripture. Number two, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White are an addition to the canon of sacred scripture. Number three, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White function as the foundation and final authority of Christian faith as does scripture. Number four, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White may be used as the basis of doctrine. Number five, we do not believe that the study of the writings of Ellen White may be used to replace the study of scripture. Number six, we do not believe that the scripture can be understood only through the writings of Ellen White. Number seven, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White exhaust the meaning of Scripture. Number eight, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White are essential for the proclamation of the truths of Scripture to society at large. Number nine, we do not believe that the writings of Ellen White are the product of mere Christian piety. And finally, number ten, we do not believe that Ellen White's use of literary sources and assistance negates the inspiration of her writings. Now the church adds one paragraph. You see it at the bottom. We conclude, therefore, that a correct understanding of the inspiration and authority of the writings of Ellen White will avoid two extremes. Number one, regarding these writings as functioning on a canonical level identical with Scripture, or number two, considering them as ordinary Christian literature. What's the point? About the critics, here's the point, brother and sister, ladies and gentlemen, here's the point. Anyone who has the time and will make use of resources available today can one by one work through any charge of any critic. Truth bears examination. Don't be afraid to tackle the big issues. What we've just done tonight in these few moments, you can do under the guidance of the same Holy Spirit that put that book together millennia ago. Now, there is help. I'm going to give you some websites. You have them in your study guide, but in case you didn't get the study guide, you'll remember these, and you'll be able to go look them up without even having to write them down. EllenWhiteAnswers.org. EllenWhiteAnswers.org. It's my friend Judd Lake. It's a very, very effective website. Take a look at it. EllenWhiteAnswers.org, and here's thewhiteestate.org, the official website, the White Estate, www.whiteestate.org. What did Paul say last night in 1 Thessalonians 5? Test all things, hold fast to that which is good, for by their fruits, Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, I want to end with this uh, YouTube clip. One of my heroes as a young minister here in the Oregon Conference, still a hero of mine really, was the godly biblical scholar and preacher named H.M.S. Richards Sr. You heard of him? Oh my, what a great man. He happened, and this is what's so, so gloriously coincidental. He happened to preach right here at our ordination at Gladstone Camp Meeting in 1979. Now, I, just, I went out running yesterday morning with my friend John Wesleyan. You know John Wesleyan, Pastor John? There was a class of seven of us, and I'm going to run the names by you because this is nostalgic, no, nostalgia time before we go to the uh, YouTube clip. So John Wesley, John and Karen Wesley, Doug and Carlene Robertson, Don and Ruth James, John Johnston, Bob Stumpf, Phil and Anita Schultz, remember Phil Schultz, 
Such a godly, powerful preacher. Died of a brain tumor a few years ago. And Karen and me. The singing men of Oregon were all over this stage as they will be tomorrow night for the, for the finale. And we were gathered, the ordinands, nervous, in the carefully arranged chairs. And Pastor Richards, Dr. Richards got up, that aged prince of the church and hero of God. And he delivered the message that day. Ordination took place right here. The hands were laid on right here. After the ordination service, he was standing about right there. And I just had to get him to sign my preaching Bible. So I came up to him and I said, excuse me, Dr. Richards, would you be so kind as to, to autograph my Bible for me? And you, you can just hear his voice. And he nodded his head. He said, give me the Bible. And give me a pen. So I, hand, I handed him a pen and the Bible. I opened the Bible to where I wanted him to sign. And I don't know if you remember uh, Pastor Richards, but his glasses were as thick as the bottom of a Coke bottle. You remember that? It's just his eyesight was just it was not good. So I remember him standing right down there under this. It was a canvas top at that time. And he, he pulled the Bible up to his face. And with that pen... He scribbled in H.M.S. Richards, Sr., and then he wrote 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Do you know what 1 Corinthians 2.2 2 reads? For I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And when that great man scribbled that reference in my humble little Bible, I said to myself, I wish to live by that same passion, by the grace of God. So, you can imagine my surprise. I'm telling you the truth. I am, I am on the web. And how I stumbled into this, I do not know. But I find a YouTube video clip of HMS Richards Sr. describing the time when as a 15-year-old young man, he sat there while this little five foot two inch woman stood in Colorado and preached. It's a beautiful reminiscence. And so, with your permission, we're going to roll it on the screen right now. Yes, I knew Sister White in this way. I heard her preach once and saw her, of course. It was in Boulder, Colorado, the camp meeting in 1909, in a building with an iron roof right at the base of the Red Rocks there. It's on the campus of the University of Colorado. And uh, she was there, I suppose there were 200 Adventists and maybe uh, the rest of 1,000 people or 800 people were just the people of the town, people of various denominations and wanted to see the Adventist prophet. I can remember when she came on the grounds in a surrey drawn by two horses, and Willie White, her son, was with her, and Miss McIntyre, her companion and nurse. And the meeting that night, she preached to us. I was sitting at her left hand, about, oh, 15 feet from her. Could see her plainly, of course, right there. Platform was about a foot, foot and a half high. And she had this big, thick Bible she was preaching faithfully giving God's message, and uh, I, I was interested. It was interesting. She was just a dear, sweet Christian mother or grandmother telling us what we ought to do. Just as she started to talk to finish off, it started to rain on that iron roof, and you can imagine. Now, remember, no amplifiers in those days, except you carried your amplifier with you. And she had a regular preaching voice, and you know, from this, from this conversational tone or voice that she'd been using, she went into her real preaching voice. And you could hear her voice just like a silver bell right through all of that confusion caused by that rain. She could talk right through the rain noise. And then she talked just about a minute, and then she kneeled down to pray. She told her son, I must pray for us. And she came over on my side of the platform 
I kneel down and pray. I can hear her now. She said, not our father, but oh, my father. And from that moment on, it was a personal communion between her and the Heavenly Father. In just a minute or two, there seemed to be a mighty power come over that meeting. And I felt it. I was just a, just a boy. and I was a member of the church. I'd been baptized about a year and a half before. And I could feel that power until finally I, I was afraid to look up for fear I'd see God standing right there by. She was talking with him. She'd forgotten all about us. And she was in the presence of the Lord. Mm. And a minute or two more went by, and that whole crowd, you could hear them weeping, crying over their sin. A tremendous revival, really. Spiritual revival, that mighty power of God. When she preached, God blessed her as a preacher. But when she began to pray, he honored her as his prophet before the people. I'll never forget it. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? What a stirring testimony. It wasn't a Jesus. It wasn't a Jesus who said, by their fruits, you will know them. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Ladies and gentlemen, I have testified last night and the night before that of all the writers I have ever read, no one so saturated with Jesus draws me to him outside of Holy Scripture more passionately than this little writer named Ellen White. You can take the critics if you wish. You take the fruit with it, the venom, the anger. Or you can take this testimony of Jesus. I believe if you take the testimony of Jesus as Jesus himself testified, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen and amen. Let's stand together as we pray, and then we'll sing together. Oh, God, we end with that testimony we just saw and heard. An eyewitness testimony. But in the end, Holy Father, the testimony that counts is the testimony of our Lord Jesus himself. The gift. Dear God, don't let us let the gift lie dusty and ignored any longer. You gave the gift to point to Jesus. We are hungry to see Jesus. We long to be a people that reflect him across this great state. So please, dear Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, give us afresh the testimony of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.